You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hey, David. Hello, Ethan. Hello. And hello, listeners out there. This is episode seven of the Common Descent podcast. This is an extremely special and exciting episode because yes. this is, as you may have guessed, our first ever guest episode. Woo! Woo. Uh, we, are, <laughs> we are very excited to be joined by uh, a friend of ours from our grad school days, mm-hmm. Ethan Fullwood. Hello, Ethan. Hello. Gentle listeners. Uh, Ethan is a doctoral student at Duke University. And if you're a longtime listener, you may recall in our early episodes, we made the case for the best animals of all time. Yes. No, no. We solved the case. Or so we thought. (laughs) Because Ethan uh, was one of a couple people who took to Twitter to argue with us. Uh, Ethan is a specialist in primates, so rather than silence him completely, we figured we would give him the opportunity to come onto the podcast and tell us about his group of animals. So thanks very much for joining us. And thank you for having me. Uh, we're re- this is uh, exciting. Yeah, sure, we'll, we'll see how it goes and we'll see uh, what, you know, kinks come up that we have to work out for future guest episodes and such. <laughs> uh, but I think it should be, I think it should be pretty good. Indeed. But before we do any of that primate stuff, uh, we got to talk about the news. Yes, and and Ethan's going to be joining us for our news segment with his own piece. Indeed. So we'll actually only be doing three news pieces today. And why don't we start with Will? All right. So my first one, or my only one, the first one, (laughs) is, it's a cool one. So it's for a new fossil analysis, Uh, not discovery, because they actually already had specimen of this. This one has been popping up a good bit, but it's a fossil that is potentially rewriting the ancestry of dinosaurs, or the early ancestors of dinosaurs. Yeah. We've touched on this before, because of uh, the flight up and the crocodilians as well, on what the ancestors of dinosaurs were and everything, and it's been a major question and debate because there's not a lot of fossils from those early years of the age of reptiles and people have all, the biggest question is were dinosaur early dinosaur ancestors small two-legged running predators which is what many think or four-legged predators uh, or mm-hmm. four-legged animals at least but usually thought was small and most tend to lean toward the two-legged and the reason for this question is because as talked about with crocodilians Archosaurs holds all the crocodilians and dinosaurs, as well as the pterosaurs, and it's split into the two main branches that had crocodilians on one side, dinosaurs and pterosaurs on the other. And so they're wondering which, whose features were more common in the ancestors. Right. You know, were they more croc-like? Were they more dinosaur-like? Who knows? This one seems to answer that question, which is very exciting, or at least give a lot of support to a potential answer. Yeah. Uh, so a... Uh, early reptile known as a Teleocrater radinus, radinus maybe. Sure. And this is this is dating about 247 to 242 million years old. So pretty narrow range that they have the date to. This is not the first specimen that was originally discovered in 1930 in Tanzania. And there were thoughts that it was a early dinosaur, but it wasn't a good specimen. Recently in 2015. They went back to Tanzania, dug again, and found multiple specimens, much better preserved, and were able to uh. make much more confirmation that it really does look like an early dinosaur, which is exciting mm-hmm. that we can get another one because they're very rare. But it looks a lot more like a croc than what we would have expected an early dinosaur to look like. Interesting. So just to clarify, uh, you're you're using the phrase early dinosaur, but this is an early ornithodiron. Yes, exactly. So outside of dinosaurs proper, rather exactly. an early, a very early relative of the early dinosaurs. Yeah, the, the early ancestor to the dinosaurs and, and their surrounding groups. And, well, pterosaurs, right? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this this is a, a would answer a lot of questions for that line. The reasons it's really odd is the truly the size and the ankles and the way it's walking. So it is a four legged. It's quadrupedal. It's not walking on just its hind legs like many of the earlier dinosaurs did and what we thought their ans the ornithodire ancestors might have. It has crocodilian like ankles, which means ball and socket joint ankles instead of hinged bird like ankles, which is the two the one of the big things that separated the crocodilian crocodilomorph and ornithodire side of archosaurs. Hmm. And it's pretty big. You're expecting something small. This is a small lion sized land predator. <laughs> So it's it's a decently sized animal, and what this bring this brings two big uh, things in the answers that most likely this means the crocodilian like ankles evolved first, and the bird like ankles came later, so that that was the ancestral of that of those two uh, designs, and now that we have a better specimen for these early ornithodires, they can help place others. And it was actually placed with a couple of other questioning families on where they were into a new group called Anaposauria, which is the earliest group of the avian stem from that divergence of the crocodilian line. Interesting. So, I guess, so it's they've they've established a group mm -hmm. of these early creatures that seem to indicate, I guess, that the croc-like features were more common in these early archosaurs as opposed to the dinosaur-like features. Yes. And pterosaur-like features. Exactly. So now there's the... And this... The teleocrator acted as kind of the center holding you know, anchorage point for these other uh, specimens and species to be brought into this new group with all the info it brought on. Interesting. It's cool stuff. Can I register my approval for calling dinosaur stem birds? <laughs> it's in their place. It's a yes, I like it. Which is funny because these are actually stem ornithodire. Like it's the, the the new group is sister to the main ornithodire lineage. So these are mm -hmm. stem stem birds. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, may or may not have chosen this news article for the fact that croc ankles rule. Uh. <laughs> Best ankles. <laughs> the original ankles, best ankles. <laughs> this is, it brings up a, a theme that has been coming up a lot in some of our recent episodes. This notion that the earliest evolution of any major group of life is always really difficult to pin down because of how hard it is to tease apart the different features early on and how hard it is to just find fossils back when a clade was just getting its start. There's always a lot of questions. Well, and as this one points out, and you know, we talked about this with early evolution of snakes, when you aren't what you are now yet, <laughs> you know, when you aren't yet a snake or you aren't yet an ornith ornithodire, you may not have the features that identifies your group. Yeah. You know, this did not have ornithodire ankles yet. It didn't have what kind of helps classify that group, but it had other features that placed it closer so it's it's not always easy to go, yeah, well, that's a early ornithodire. It's like, oh, no, it's that could be if you didn't have the, you know, if you were missing some part, you would have been like, no, it's an early crocodilian, obviously. Yep. You know, so it's it's really hard sometimes to tease out what each one is because they're not either yet. Yes. <laughs> they're not there yet. Cool. Ethan, you brought a news piece. Would you like to talk about that? Indeed. Uh, Yay. Oh, actually, uh, sorry, real quick, we should point out um, that that last study was published in Nature by Sterling Nesbitt and, and others. Yes, I meant to mention that. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ethan. <laughs> so I have a paper from uh, the Journal of Mammalogy um, from Jacelyn Alperdi and all, et al. Um, from various universities of California. Uh, and it's actually, um, of course, I study fossil primates. So I got a paper about modern bats, um, and it's it's looking at uh, two two bats in the Sonoran Desert um, of Mexico, northern Mexico, and one of them is the pallid bat. Uh, also, genus name is uh, sorry, I have to look at it. 
um, and Trosus pallidus. And it's, it's mostly a temperate bat. So this is a bat that's all, all over the Rocky Mountain West, up into Canada, actually. Hmm. And it overlaps in its southernmost range with this tropical bat, Leptonycteris. And both of them in this range do something sort of unusual. They uh, pollinate cactus. So they, they eat the nectar of the cactus. And in so doing, they, they act as, as pretty effective pollinators. And Leptonycteris is, is a frugivorous and uh, fruit-eating and, and nectar-eating specialist in tropical forests, which is, which is common of, of a lot of tropical animals, particularly tropical bats. Um, but pal- the pallid bats are not. The pallid bats are, are regular insectivorous bats. And in fact, all temperate bats are insectivorous, more or less. Um, that there are there really aren't any frugivorous bats known, and, and only one other nectivorous bat, and it's a it's a species from New Zealand. So it's unusual that they they exploit nectar in this environment. It turns out pallid bats are actually a little bit better at exploiting nectar than Leptonycteris because Leptonycteris will sort of hover next to the flower and stick its little nose in and get the nectar and then go on its way and it's very efficient and nice. But the pallid bats, because they're not very good <laughs> at it, they have to land on the cactus and like stick their whole head into the into the flower and move around for a few seconds and then fly away. So they're just covered in pollen. And obviously, that's pretty <laughs> it's pretty great for the cactus. Um, and there's actually a video of, of these things feeding um, on the supplementary information if, if any of the listeners are inclined to to see this. Um, Absolutely. So it's well known that they're nect- nectivores, but what's not known is whether or not pallid bats are actually eating fruit, which would be really unusual because there's no, there are no temperate uh, frugivorous bats. And so to find out, um, the authors did, they first they, they just watched the bats as they um, fed at night. And they even did this interesting thing where they, they removed the fruit and then weighed it and bolted it back onto the cactus in order to see if, if you know, to, to weigh it, to weigh the pulp before and after feeding events at night to see if the, the bats are eating eating the pulp. Um, and then also, <laughs> so what, one problem with, with just watching the bats feed or even, even measuring the fruit is the bats may not be going for the fruit. They may be going for moths that are on the fruit and then, um, you know, doing a lot of damage to the fruit and flying away with like pulp all over their face, but not actually eating the fruit. They're just eating the moths. And so to make sure yeah. that they're actually eating moths, they used, or not eating moths, but eating eating fruit, they used um, stable isotopes. So I have to back up a bit um, to, to chemistry. Um, so isotope, <laughs> you know, most people know what isotopes are. Um, so different <laughs> atoms of an, ele- of an element will sometimes have, sometimes have different numbers of neutrons, and uh, th- that creates different isotopes, so, so different elements of the same atom of different weight. And carbon has unstable isotopes, which are used for uh, carbon dating, so like carbon... Um, carbon-14, but it also has two, two stable isotopes that are common in nature, carbon-12 and carbon-13, and those will just persist forever. And different plants, plants use different photosynthetic pathways in order to make energy out of carbon dioxide and water and, and sunlight. And the different photosynth- photosynthetic pathways will differentially retain um, one of the isotopes over another. And it turns out the cactus is, uses something called a CAM pathway, which is a really efficient pathway for desert environments. But most plants are used to use a C3 pathway. And insects, which feed on plants, for the, for the most part, are going to be C3, going to have a C3 signature. They're not going to have a, a, a CAM signature in their, in their ratio. So you can actually tell um, from, you know, from anything where the carbon isotope is being incorporated into the body of the, ant, of the, uh, of the bat, whether or not it's eating mostly C4 or, or CAM or C3 plants. So that's kind of a cool a cool, Very um, cool use of the use of this yeah. chem- chemistry technique. And what, and what they did, they, they snipped some flesh off of the bat's wing. So they, the bats were fine. And then, and they also put them in a little <laughs> box and got their breath and saw what the ratio of the two carbon um, isotopes were in their breath. So that gave you a sort of a long-term and a short-term signal of, of uh, cam path or cam or, or C3 pathway in their diet. And what they found out is that these bats apparently eat fruit as much as the tropical bats these, these uh, temperate bats. So this is the first record of a frugivorous temperate bat. It's pretty cool. It's also interesting because they're not morphologically adapted to eat fruit at all. Um, they have pointy teeth. They have um, gut passage times that aren't great for fruit. They have um, urine that's very um, sort of conserva- or conservative and gets rid of nitrates without lots of water, which is something that insectivorous bats have, but not frugivorous bats. So it's, it's actually kind of annoying for someone who studies dental morphology to understand diet, which I do, that um, <laughs> these bats are like going out eating fruit without needing fruit eating teeth, but you know, whatever. But it, it, it is it is a model for maybe how frugivory can evolve though, because these bats probably start eating fruit by eating moths. So they saw, saw a nice moth on a fruit, got the moth, maybe got a little fruit, figured out the fruit tastes nice, it's good energy. And so they began to just eat the fruit and they eat it seasonally. They don't eat it all year, 
so only in the summer. But it's, and it's also polymorphic in that population, which is kind of cool. So you're actually seeing, you're almost seeing evolution in action. So some bats eat fruit, some bats don't eat fruit. Uh, so it's a cool study. Very cool. Yeah, that ties actually nicely into the point that I made before of trying to identify the early evolution of something, because here's a group of bats that are possibly just starting on this practice of fruit eating, and they don't have any real adaptations for it, which means if you were looking at these bats from the fossil record, you wouldn't think to to infer that they were eating fruit. They have yeah. insect eating teeth. And so you would say, oh, well, they're insect bats. And then, you know, two million years later, their next descendants are obviously fruit eating bats. And you're like, where the heck did that happen? Mm -hmm. It's it's always odd behavior in a group of animals or a type of animal that is obviously one kind of diet, but then at times or when it's available takes a different food can really, you know, it's hard to, one, you can't predict always when that is happening in the fossil record, and it's hard to keep that in mind when you're looking at something that's, well, very obviously an insect eater, but maybe it ate fruit. Uh, yeah. And it's like when, you know, you find videos of white-tailed deer eating baby birds and yes. stuff that are, you know, ground-nesting birds. No one, had you shown everyone that's a skull of a bird, of the, a deer, no one would have gone as like, I think sometimes it might eat birds. You all agree? <laughs> it's it's animals do weird things that their bodies don't always show that they're doing. Plasticity. It's very it's, it's probably a key adaptation for, for, for lots of different different groups of animals. Yeah. yeah. Just be nice if they told us. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote it on the bones for us. Yes. By the way. By sometimes I ate meat. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So the final uh, news piece, my news piece, also from California researchers. This is a study that was published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution from some researchers at uh, University of California in LA. And this was a study looking at how injuries on the bones of saber-toothed cats and dire wolves reflect their different predatory hunting styles which is a really cool kind of roundabout way to get at this question of how these predators were hunting. Mm -hmm. So these are two predators that are found in the La Brea Tar Pits. And for anyone out there who's not super familiar with the La Brea Tar Pits, these are, you know, late Ice Age area that was collecting lots and lots of different animals. And if you are a paleontologist and you don't study in the La Brea Tar Pits, you are immensely envious and maybe a little bit angry at the people who do get to study at the La Brea Tar Pits <laughs> because there's just tens of thousands of bones of all these different cool animals and it allows you to do in-depth analyses that you can't do at most fossil sites. Uh, if you ever get to go to the uh, Page Museum, I believe it was, they have an entire wall of just wolf skulls and it's 400 or so wolf skulls that they've pulled out of these pits. <laughs> Unfair. So this study, they examined more than 35,000 bones belonging to Smilodon fatalis, which is the saber-toothed cat, and Canis diarus, which is the dire wolf, looking for where these pathologies or injuries on the bones were. And they found that a small percentage of each species uh, had some injuries on their bodies, Smilodon had more injuries in general, which they interpreted as an indicator that Smilodon's hunting style might be a little riskier than the wolves. And they found that the most common injuries for Smilodon happened on the shoulder and the back, whereas the most common injuries for the wolves were happening on wrists and ankles and the neck. And so they're inferring, basically, how does their hunting style relate to these patterns of injury? And Smilodon being a cat, if you look at cats today, they tend to be ambush predators. If you play with your pet cat at home, they play with their hands because that's how cats take down their prey with their big beefy arms and they wrestle it to the ground and they bite it real quick. Whereas wolves and most canids are chasing their prey down with feet that are really well adapted for running long distances, grabbing it with their faces and pulling it down to the ground. So the authors interpret that 
the injuries that they're seeing on Smilodon are probably happening while they're struggling to wrestle their prey down using the, you know, those arm and back muscles. Whereas the wolves might be getting ankle and wrist and neck injuries while they're running and trying to grab their prey and either tripping or getting kicked by, you know, a horse or a camel or a bison or whatever it is they're trying to take down, that these injuries are being sustained during these high intensity hunting times. It's pretty cool. It's, you know, to use this, you know, the detective method of looking at the injuries to figure out how they were living. Uh, and it's it's really neat being able to compare especially cat and dog, since those are two vastly different hunting methods typically. And because saber-toothed cats, it's been a question or debated for quite a while, and often how exactly they were living and hunting since they have such extreme dental gear. And people have been yeah. wondering exactly how they were using that and therefore how were they hunting for the longest time because no cat remotely has those overhanging fangs that Smiling On does so we don't have a direct example to look at. Yeah, but they share with other cats, and this has been known for a long time, that they still have that bulky frame mm -hmm. and those wrestler's arms. Yeah. So they were almost certainly doing a similar thing to modern cats where wrestling things to the ground. What would be really interesting, I think, to look at is if they could compare, and I didn't read through the entire article itself, so they may have made a comment of this, but it would be really interesting to see if they could compare injuries, these patterns of injuries with what we see in modern day big cats and modern day mm -hmm. canids like wolves and African hunting dogs and such. Yeah, absolutely. So are are there American lions at La Brea, like conical tooth cats? I believe so. So if they could do that, maybe they did. Yeah, that would be cool too. This this study was focused on I believe this was done by a couple of graduate students actually. Yes. yes and it was. it was focusing on those two taxa. I I'm pretty sure that the American lion is also represented at La Brea. Don't quote me on that. Um so yeah, that would be another thing is to look at because there are other predators at La Brea as well. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think those are probably the two most common and two of the bigger ones. Yeah. But it, it would be cool to extend this type of analysis to similar uh, predators and see how, how you are, are most sabered and you know, scimitar cats showing the same injuries. Yeah. You know, it'd be fun to do wherever the, the specimens are bountiful enough. Well, it's yeah. interesting how, how many times saber tooth toothedness evolves for something we have no idea, you know, because we have no modern um, analogs, but it evolved what, in marsupials, it evolves in rabbits, it evolves in cats. Um, so it must yeah. be, there must be something, something cool about having saber teeth, but we have no idea what, what it was. Yeah. And it's one of those things that was, it's not like it was something that was really good in, you know, in the Oligocene and then disappeared. It seems like the only reason we don't have it now is because we're fresh off of a mass extinction mm -hmm. and we happen to have lost all of the saber-toothed mammal predators. Yeah, it's it's baffling that something that was so popular evolutionarily and, you know, common among multiple groups of animals and we don't have we don't have anyone left to to look at that's using it, which is I think that's the mystique of it. I, you know, that's the not only does it look cool, so that's why it's popular in culture, but it's one of those things that there's lots of it, and we we don't have any clue why they had it, or specifically how they were using it. The only exception, I believe, is Neophilus, which I think is the clouded leopard, mm -hmm. has crazy long canines. Yeah. They're not Smilodon crazy long. But I know that some people have have looked to them to see it, well, what they're doing and how they might indicate, you know, give us some clues as to what these other saber and scimitar creatures were doing with them. I remember uh, back in grad school, in that it, many debated whether that's a good example or not. You know, yeah. some using it to look at, it and some saying that it's going to be misleading. And so it's, but that's it's a cool one. And and there, you know, we had one of their skulls, and it's they're pretty crazy. Yeah. Cool. Well, there's right. the news. That is Only it. Only three this time. 
As always, we'll put those links up on our blog post for the episode. And now it is time to get into primates. So, Ethan, you have an hour to try and convince our impressionable listeners that primates are worthy of note. <laughs> uh, but why don't we start off by just, uh, if we, we, we may ask you to tell us what makes a primate. Certainly. All right. So you could rattle off um, sort of a number of traits that primates all share. So they have a post-orbital bar and they have a auditory bulla formed from the petrosal, all these sorts of things. Um, I think it, it might be it might be useful to sort of uh, gen- generalize maybe what what are the big adaptive uh, adaptive profiles that primates share and what are the trends mm-hmm. in primate evolution. Um, so these mm-hmm. aren't universals, but but almost all primates are, for example, arboreal. Arboreality is just it's, it, there, there's something there's something very important about arboreality to primate origins. So there are a few exceptions. We are an exception. We're non arboreal primate. But other than other than just the, these few animals, mostly within one group called the catarines, um, all primates are arboreal. In arboreal, of course, uh, arboreal, of course, referring to living in trees, uh, spending yes. most of your time in trees, and not just any part of the tree. But we seem to be something called terminal branch specialists. So you know, lots of arboreal animals, squirrels, binturongs, all kinds of things, red pandas, uh, the nature's greatest non-primate animal. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, red panda episode coming up sometime. Seal of approval. Um, but uh, primates are able to go much further out on the ends of branches than lots of these animals and more habitually. So there's some so something about getting to the ends of narrow branches in trees are were, were, were probably important to primate origins. And one of the key features of primates are that we don't have claws on our fingers. We have nails. You can compare your hand to that of a cat or dog. They have these little claws. Um, we have these, these squishy pads with, with flat nails on them. And that, you know, no one, no one can give you a completely decisive answer about what that's for or why we do that or why we have that. <laughs> but it seems to be something about grasping narrow supports probably. Um, and it's, it's a little bit easier to do that when you don't have claws. So that's one thing. Another thing, uh, primates have a lot of vision specializations. So when we talk about the post-orbital mm-hmm. bar or post-orbital closure, primates are on just a general trajectory away from sensa- sensing the world using olfaction and using touch towards sensing the world using vision. So in many ways, this is sort of a reversal of the big mammalian trend. So mammals, from when you go from mammal-like reptiles to, ma- to mammals, you, you de-emphasize vision and you emphasize touch and smell. This is sort of the big story of mammalian evolution. Primates right. sort of hitting reverse on that. They're going back to vision as, as their major adaptation. So, you, so yeah. primates have a much higher level of trichromacy, so they can see th- three colors um, than most other mammals. Not all primates can do that, but, but a, lot, a lot of primates can, and, and most mammals can't. Um, primates get the get these specializations of the skull that bring the eyes forward and also isolate the eyes from the chewing muscles so we can get more acuity in our vision and, and sense things maybe at greater distance, maybe with, with, with more reliability um, when we're trying to, to navigate spaces and we're trying to get food, something like that. Um, the classic binocular vision that we're famous for. Yeah, which is interesting because binocular vision is typically associated with predatory lifestyles yes which, which is why one of the major sort of hypotheses for you primate origins um, you primates are tr- so-called true primates um there, there's a there's a bit of a terminological mess over primates um, and what, <laughs> where, where to draw the line between primates and some other fossil groups but, but so, so true primates um may have originated as predators of small animals and sort of bushy environments it's called the visual predation hypothesis that, that draws on that analogy mm-hmm. with predators um, there's there's other ideas for why you might have forward facing vision. It may, it may, it may be to do with locomotion, right? Because we pr- primates are primates leap quite a lot, and we leap in ways that no other mammal leaps, or at least some of us do. Um, so they have this adaptation called vertical clinging and leaping, which we, we talk about. We talk about some of the uh, lemurs and things um, that no other mammal does. And so may, maybe the, this 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 tendency to to leap in certain ways may have something to do with our visual orientation. Um, in general, there just seems to be a complex of features here. Um, but an, another big one um, is frugivory. So not all primates eat fruit, and not all primates eat exclusively fruit, but almost all primates eat fruit. Um, very few primates don't consume fruits. Um, you hear that, kids? You hear that, kids? <laughs> eat your fruit. Eat your fruit. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stay with the fruit. 
So, so fruit, fruit eating, it may, you know, obviously primates aren't the only animals that eat fruit either, but fruit eating seems to be something that happens very early in primate evolution. So you can recognize the teeth of primates. And in the fossil record, we're not finding beautiful skeletons where, where you can see, you know, all, the, all these primate features all the time. Um, yeah. When you recognize a fossil primate, the way you recognize any fossil mammal by its teeth, really. And the teeth, so the, the things that happen that make primate teeth look like primate teeth, they get a little flatter, the, the cusps get a little rounder. And those seem to be adaptations for crushing things, maybe. And the fact that almost all primates eat fruit, and the primates are probably important seed dispersers in lots of environments. All this stuff suggests that fruit is part of the primate story. Maybe it's not all, it's probably not all the primate story, but, but it's part of the primate story. And one final thing that makes primates, makes generalizations about primates very difficult. Primates emphasize plasticity as an adaptation um, in almost every respect. So primates have a loco have locomotor behavior that's more plastic and adaptable than other animals. They have social behavior that's more plastic and adaptable than other animals. But primates are just really good at kind of taking whatever's thrown at them. With the singular exception of temperature changes, primates, so the, it's the last sort of big primate, almost all primates um, generalization. Um, primates live in tropical areas, tropical and paratropical areas, pretty much exclusively. So humans are an exception, of course, as, as, with, as with many things. There are a couple of macaques that live in temperate areas, including the famous Japanese macaques that live up in you know, the snow and stuff. But yeah. almost no other primates venture outside of the, the tropics or are very close to the tropics. Um, so we can't we can't handle environmental changes very well. But uh, every other kind of change, primates are just are, are sort of there for it, and because plasticity is an important part of primate adaptations. Interesting. Very good. So this is the the famous aspects of primates is that they're you know, problem solvers in that way of you know they can wade rivers they can walk on the ground they can climb the tree they can figure out how to eat different things and so that, that plasticity gives them you know advantages with whatever's thrown at them and, and this is probably so cogn cognitive evolution is something you always talk about primates primates have you know primates don't have the largest brains universally of every group of any group of animals or non-primate animals that have big brains etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know you pick a random primate and pick a random mammal the primate probably has the bigger brain and it probably it's probably would score better on you know whatever kind of intelligence you want to give it so but primates in general are emphasizing cognitive abilities and that's probably part of that plasticity very cool interesting so and these are things that it, it's it's really cool when you talk i like the way that you talk about primates because you talk about you don't talk about them in the third person you talk about <laughs> primates in the collective first person yep is yeah, a lot of those features that, that you just listed are things that we see in ourselves being parts of this group uh, as well. Which brings up the next question, of course, which is, you know, with an understanding of what makes primates primates, what are primates today? So what is, mm -hmm. what, what is the diversity of primates that we see in the modern world? So there are, I should have looked at the number of primate species uh, uh, Wikipedia says 233 <laughs> for what that's worth. <laughs> so, so probably something like that. Of course, th this is something that's um, a little controversial. Like how many mouse lemurs do you want to name or whatever? Um, but, <laughs> so there's something like 200, maybe more primates. There's a lot of primates. Um, and Well, a lot compared to, you know, like crocodilians maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, when, you, when you're going for quantity, not quality. <laughs> well, that would be the, the sister group to, to primates. Um, well, okay. So, so primates are within so primates within mammals. Um, there are four four big groups of mammals defined mostly genetically: um, xenarthra, sloths, and armadillos, and strange South American animals; Ephrotheria, elephants and hyraxes, and elephant shrews, and manatees, and strange African animals; um, Laurasiotheria, which is almost every mammal you've ever heard of. Um, Carnivores, ungulates, shrews, bats, all those animals. The the last group are this group, Eurocontagliaries. We are Eurocontagliaries. That's primates, um, and then two other groups of animals that form Euroconta. And Euroconta is from Arconta, which means ruling animals. And the U um, was added to mean to mean true Arconta when bats were taken out. So people used to think bats were related to primates. And there's even some um, weird uh, features of the visual system, the way the way fruit bats process. Um, process the sight and then it has to do with the, the crossing over of the of the two optical fields in the chiasm is actually the same as the way primates as the only other mammal that does this so it's a crazy yeah. convergence but all the genetics say that bats aren't related to primates so i guess not and they're they're related to like shrews and things um so that's uarconta and then the the gliris are rodents and then lagomorphs which are rabbits and pikas and things 
So, so our closest non-primate relatives um, are, well, two, two, two animals, um, the flying lemur, which doesn't fly and isn't a lemur, and the tree shrews, which aren't <laughs> shrews and mostly don't live in trees. Um, and then the group outside of that are the uh, rodents and things. So when you see a mouse, that's your not-so-distant cousin. <laughs> so, so these two other Eurocontin animals are sort of interesting. Um, so tree shrews, they're little. They're a little bit squirrel-like. Um, they run around Southeast Asia. There is one species that does live in trees called Tylocircus, and Tylocircus is the smallest tree shrew. It's the most insectivorous. A lot of people have used it as a model for sort of the ancestral primate or even the ancestral eutherian mammal because it's a very generalized sort of scansorial and nocturnal animal, a lot like you can imagine animals living in the Mesozoic. Um, and then there are other, the other animals in that group. Some of them get kind of big. Um, and they're cool. I love tree trees. Um, some of the, <laughs> there's a nice video on YouTube you can find of one um, licking the secretions from a pitcher plant and then leaving behind droppings and suggestions. It's a, it's a David Attenborough documentary. And the suggestion is that maybe they're co-evolving with the pitcher plants. Who knows? But um, flying lemurs, also called colugos, to avoid the confusion, um, are are even more specialized. So, so these are gliding animals, and they're quite large, about two kilogram animals. So this is a, it's a big critter to be flying through the air. Um, and they glide in this unique way. Um, they actually, they're called mitten gliders. So it's imagine like a blanket with little four corners in it and you stick your hands to the four corners. And that's, the, that's kind of what they, what they look like. They don't have a patagia between their arms. It actually extends over their hands. Um, and they're interesting. They're, they're, you know, and and they, these both live in Southeast Asia, which is perhaps tells us something about primate origins. So the Southeast Asian rainforests are the oldest forest in the world. Um, Essentially, these are forests that used to cover all of Asia. And then as climate change and things happened, they retreated down to uh, Southeast Asia. So th these, these animals have, were probably widespread over Asia before have retreated with the forest. And we do have fossils of uh, tree trees from even the Miocene of like Pakistan. So, so we know w when the forests were out there, these animals were out there. So, th so th these may be, you know, this may be the, the, the last refugium of this um, once formerly widespread is formerly widespread groups that are very old and that may tell something about primate origin so primates may, may have come from these forests either southeast asia or, or when the forest covered more of asia that may be sort of the, the 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 origin point for for primates very cool interesting so these two groups uh your tree shrews which aren't shrews then don't live in trees and your flying lemurs which aren't lemurs and don't fly everything's lies everything's lies uh so these are sort of the next cousins of primates right we're we're stay we used this word stem early on we were we were joking around so stem uh tends to refer to the you know th things that are around the earliest evolution of a group closest relatives of the group so these are just outside of primates proper right and they're not they're not they're not stem animals because they're still alive but um but yeah those are the out groups for for primates it's an interesting point I had not. Is that how you define stem? Does stem have to be extinct? Yeah. So, so a stem animal is going to be anything that's on the line to a to a living group that's more closely related to that living group than to the next living group out. Yeah. So if these, so if tree shrews, so let's say hypothetically somehow tree shrews and flying lemurs became extinct. I don't know what would cause creatures in tropical <laughs> rainforests today to become extinct, but yeah, yeah it's. We're we're talking crazy here, but let's <laughs> keep going. Hypothetically, they would then, I guess, be considered stem primates. Right. Although I don't know how stem works with recent extinctions. Um, Interesting. If, if it has to be, I don't know. I mean, it, it's obviously artificial. <laughs> what's alive and what's extinct. Right, right. But but it is. You have to qualify. <laughs> they have to apply for it. <laughs> All right. Cool. So so what about primates? What are what's the diversity of primates then? Uh, so there, so primates, if you imagine a, a phylogenetic tree, primates are, there, there's one big split of the base of primates. On the one hand, you have animals called strepsirhines, and that means wet-nosed, because they have a wet nose just like a dog, so it's a primitive retention from other mammals. And the other end, haplorhines, which means dry-nosed. So strepsirhines are two, two groups of animals themselves, so the, the lorises and galagos on the one hand, and these live in mainland Africa and in Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia. And galagos are also called bush babies. You've probably maybe seen them. They hop around. They're pretty cute. 
Um, and lorises are these little slow climbing animals that you may know from the internet, people tickling them. That's actually their fear response. Like don't, don't, don't tickle lorises. Don't have lorises as pets. That's my conservation message. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're also very conservation oriented. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's that group. And then there are a couple of African um, animals similar to lorises uh, called guanabos and, po and podos. Those are all interesting animals. Uh, and the galagos are interesting because they do this vertical clinging and leaping thing I mentioned. Uh, at least some of them do, the smaller ones do. You see that in, if, if people out there haven't watched Planet Earth 2, uh, the vertical okay. clinging and leaping thing shows up a few times uh, over the course of the documentary. Yeah, excellent. Um, so that's them. I don't know as much else to say about them. And then the other group are the lemurs. Um, so the lemurs are very, the very the famous primates of Madagascar. Um, all, all lemurs form one clade. They apparently came to Madagascar by rafting, one, one presumes, because Madagascar broke off from Africa during the Jurassic, I think. So it's a, it's a very it's a very old geological divergence. They couldn't have they couldn't have you know evolved there. And actually, Madaga Madagascar moved through a desert belt tectonically, so it probably scrubbed all the native animals anyway. Um, so they must have come there at some point um, from mainland Africa. There's no fossil record of them in mainland Africa. There's no fossil record for them anywhere because Madagascar doesn't have a Cenozoic fossil record. So all we have are the animals that live, live now, and then some what we call subfossil lemurs that went extinct either in the Pleistocene or quite recently, maybe, maybe within the last thousand years. And uh, modern lemurs are amazing. They're, they're enormously diverse. Um, they, they, they range from the uh, sort of a tie for the smallest primate, the mouse lemurs, up to, if you include the subfossil lemurs, almost a tie for the largest primate. So some of these were as big as female gorillas. They live, the, the modern ones are almost all arboreal. Um, the lemur cata, the ringtail lemur, you might know from zoos and things. Um, it spends a lot of time on the ground. Some of them leap, um, it's that vertical clinging and leaping. Um, so the Propithecus and Indries, and the Indries is the largest lemur, do that leaping. So they're, some of them eat bamboo, um, even toxic bamboo, which they can process the chemicals in. Um, some of them live in spiny deserts. They live in all the environments of Madagascar. And the Madagascar is a, you know, the size of California. It's a huge, it's like a continent island. So they're cool animals. Very much so. Um, some, some of the extinct ones uh, knuckle walked and some moved like sloths and moved like ground sloths and so many wonderful things about lemurs. <laughs> Sounds like there's a lemurs episode to do as well. Oh, absolutely. And and I should say that one one character that unites all of these strepsorines. We we tend to think of strepsorines as the primitive primates, and so we we use them as models for Eocene primates, and even I I do a little bit of that myself. And I think that's, you know, it's probably largely fair. Um, if we can think of Madagascar almost as like the place where the Eocene never ended, you know, where, where these sort of Persimian primates are, are still the dominant life form, dominant primate forms. Interesting. But they do have a lot of specializations. And one of the specialization is a, as a structure in the front of the mouth called a tooth comb. And all the straps around share a tooth comb and they use it to groom themselves. So it's, it's, it's basically their four, their four lower inc or incisors and then their um, canines together form a complex and then jut out forward in the in the front of the mouth and they use it to groom themselves and also to spread scent gland stuff all over themselves so these guys still use a lot of scent communication they still have an, a, a working it's called a jacobson's organ which most mammals have which um, anthropoid primates lose function of um, these guys still have a working one it senses chemicals and things cool very cool well so the other the, the other big clade are the these haplorines and haplorines are themselves two groups um, the tarsiers and tarsiers are very cool, very strange animals. Some mm -hmm. of the strangest primates, some of the strangest mammals. Um, they live in insular Southeast Asia, so islands to the Philippines and, and two islands of Indonesia. And they are totally fornivorous. They only eat animals, insects and small lizards and things. And they, they leap like they do that vertical leaping, leaping, but they, they do it way more than the other primate. Like they're pretty much specialists for this kind of leaping. Um, they're nocturnal. <laughs> they're super tiny. They're, this, they're, they're, they're the other tie for the smallest primate. And they, they've lost a reflective layer in the eye called the tapetum lucidum that, that the strepsorines all have. So in order to be nocturnal and to see things and to hunt visually, they have to just have huge eyes, apparently. So each of their eyes is as large as their brain. So cool. they're cool animals. So that's Tarsiers. Very strange. Interesting. The, <laughs> the other big group are the anthropoids, and we, we are anthropoids. Anthropoids are monkeys and apes, or monkeys, apes, and humans. And then there are two, the two group, two big groups of monkeys, or so-called monkeys, the New World monkeys, which I really don't think should be called monkeys. I think it is it underrates what an amazing radiation they are, because they do all kinds of things just like Old World monkeys, but also they do things like apes. Some of them are suspensory animals, like spider monkeys that that 
do, you know, the kind of movement that apes do. Some of them leap like a lemur, but this animal called Pythes Pythesia leaps. Some of them are very small, there's a nocturnal one, the, the owl monkey. Um, and, and these New World monkeys are called New World monkeys. They live in the New World, they live in the tropics, the neotropics. Um, so South America and Central America. That's that big race, they're called platyrines. And then the group catarines include the Old World monkeys. So these are your, most of the monkeys you've ever heard of, um, baboons, macaques, forest monkeys called iguanins, uh, these other leaf-eating forest monkeys called colobus monkeys. Um, they live most, they live all over Africa and Asia, and they have a specialization of their teeth called a bilophodont molar that is sort of their, their super weapon against everything. Like all of their teeth are very <laughs> similar um, to each other, relatively speaking, because a bilophodont molar is just a way of eating anything you want to eat, apparently. So these guys are, mm -hmm. they, they're awesome. They've taken over the world, basically. <laughs> and then the group that they took over the world at the expense of are the apes. And the apes, of course, include us. And they're, you know, I think most people know, know the apes pretty well. They're, there's only, they're gibbons, so the so-called lesser apes, and there are several species of them. And then there are only, um, well, I guess, depends on how you want to count again, but maybe four species of great apes. The bonobo and the chimpanzee, which are our closest relatives, the gorillas, um, and then the orangutans, and of course Woo! us. It's a cool division that separation between the new world and old world monkeys or the new world, old world primates, because it's really, it's, it's one of my favorite go-to examples of biogeographic indicators of evolutionary history. Mm -hmm. This notion that these anthropoid uh, monkeys, anthropoid primates split at one point, a group of them made their way over across the Atlantic. And we talked about rafting in our uh, island evolution episode. Mm-hmm and then seeded opposite sides of the Atlantic and have stayed there, right? As far as I'm aware, and correct me if I'm wrong, only one species of New World versus Old World monkeys has ever spread outside of those boundaries, and that's the one species that insists upon doing everything differently, and that's <laughs> us. <laughs> technically Old World. Right. Well, and of course, we've we've put monkeys in the, uh, in the New World, so there's like wild macaque colonies and... and... Down, down in Florida, well, you might 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 see some macaques yeah. running around. Um, yeah, I know I've heard about those uh, of people working with and studying those. Florida is is like the the mad scientist petri dish when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to invasive species. Of if you have a tropical species, bring it to Florida. We'll find a place for it to live. <laughs> it's, it's they where, all seem it's to love it here. Major tropical species go to retire. Right. It's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got great golf courses and <laughs> they love it. I've I've heard that they do actually. <laughs> <laughs> they they truly do. Uh that it, yeah, it's crazy that we have, you know, even a monkey species that has gotten here. Uh but even more so, kudos to the monkey for surviving here. Like goes back to what you were saying of it got moved to a a place where there are no monkeys. <laughs> there are none whatsoever, and they're like, "Yeah, we can make this work." Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. and one one uh, distinction to make, um, if it wasn't clear from my little head head phylogenetic tree, um, so old world monkeys are more closely related to apes than they are to new world monkeys, which is part of why I think that this this new world monkey is probably a little misleading. Um, really, we yeah. should call them I don't know some other name. New world, new world primates. New world grabby hand creatures. <laughs> so that's our modern primates. And then just like we did in our snakes episode, let's go ahead and jump back to the beginning. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about primate origins and, and the earliest, the early evolutionary stages of the primate family tree? Where'd they all come from? Yes. Whence primates. <laughs> So we have uh, one big group of fossil Eurocontins, and we call them the Plesiodapiforms. And Plesiodapiforms are conventionally considered stem primates, to go back to the stem, stem word. So they would be the, the, the extinct animals more closely related to primates than to their immediate outgroup. So it's, I, it's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> I like that that's your professional opinion. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. probably true. Most likely. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a problem not only with a group of animals that is very close to the origins of your content, so it probably doesn't, so, you know, it's difficult to find features, um, but also is very specialized in its own way. So, so plesiodapiforms immediately begin losing teeth, almost in all the lineages, and they do strange things with their teeth. L lots of them evolve these huge premolars, these pla called plagiacaloid premolars. 
and other specializations of their skeleton. So they're they're weird animals in certain respects, and they're and they're specialized animals. So it makes it hard makes it hard to imagine that primates evolve from any one group of these. So if primates of primates are related to Plesiodapiforms, are related at the very very earliest Plesiodapiform, which is actually this animal called Purgatorius, which is found right on the boundary between the um, Mesozoic and the, and the Cenozoic in Montana. And some of them are maybe even known from the Cretaceous. So they, those may be our closest relatives, but whatever they are, they're interesting animals, and, and they diversify quite a lot in the Paleocene and the Eocene. And so there's, there's lots of forms, there are lots of body sizes, they're doing lots of interesting ecological things, and, they're, and some of them are filling niches that are pretty similar to what primates will end up filling. So this group called the Carpalestids actually evolved nails, just like primates, and they're, they're probably eating fruit like maybe primates are eating. Um, but they, they can't have given risen, rise to primates because of those weird dental specializations. Interesting. So that's okay. Plesiodapa forms. Um, the earliest true primate fossils are actually known from Africa. Well, it's one species called, called Altiat lazius, known from Morocco. And it's a Paleocene primate, which is pretty pretty crazy. And we know almost nothing else about it. <laughs> it's, it's just a few teeth. <laughs> it doesn't seem really clearly like any other primates. No one knows where it came from. It may be a Plesiodapa form and not a primate. So it's not... You know, it's an exciting fossil, but it's hard to say anything else about it. So the, the U-primate story really begins right at the boundary between the Paleocene and the Eocene. So this is around that sort of 55 million years ago or so, not too long after the big extinction. Right. So, so, so the Paleocene is what, the 10 million years between the extinction of the dinosaurs and, and, and this. Um, and, and right at that boundary, there's an event called the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. So this is a transient spike in global temperatures. Um, temperatures get about as hot as they get during the Cenozoic for for about two hundred thousand years, and then they go back down again. And people, no one could tell you like with complete a complete answer of why, but it probably has something to do with the release of uh, meth of greenhouse gases from methane clathrates in deep sea deposits and things like that. So during this event. Uh, high latitude land bridges open up, so so the world is already connected by these land bridges from during the Paleocene. So Beringia, the land bridge between Asia and Europe, is open, and there's probably another land bridge between Europe and North America. Um, and, and and there's actually probably not a land bridge between Europe and Asia. So this is interesting. So the, so dispersals have to have to go Europe to North America to Asia. They can't go to Asia to Europe. Um, this these things called the Turkey Straits. Anyway, um, interesting. So, so these land bridges are there, and there's probably things that can go across the so filter dispersal, but tropical animals almost certainly aren't among them. And, and that means that primates, wherever they are in the Paleocene, we're not finding them, because almost all of our fossil record comes from Europe and North America. And this is for geological reasons, it's also for historical and, and political reasons, right? Because those are the places that have had paleontology for a long time, people have been doing this kind of work. So primates appear right during the Paleocene using thermal maximum. And they appear three places. They appear in China, they appear in North America, at two different places in North America, Wyoming and Mississippi, and they appear in Europe at essentially the same time geologically. Like you can work out with, with you know, high resolution stratigraphy, which is first, and it's actually probably the ones in Wyoming, um, but the ones in China are more primitive. So almost certainly those are, you know, those are actually originated, originated earlier or branched off earlier. Mm -hmm. The point is that these animals didn't evolve there, right? They, they, they're immigrating from somewhere, and they're probably immigrating over these land bridges very rapidly. So, so that's, that's the beginning of the primate story. And it's why it's sort of frustrating to talk about primate origins, because we, we almost by definition don't have a fossil record of primate origins. They're coming from somewhere else, maybe Southeast Asia, somewhere where we don't have a fossil record, and they're appearing once they're already primates. That's really cool to me. Because you hear all the time, articles written, news stories, love to pick them up, you know, even mainstream news loves to pick it up whenever human origins is discussed and that's been brought under such a fine microscope that it often feels like we have a you know that we know you know our origin story forward and backward but they don't ever go back to yes but where did we actually you know where did primates come from not just our one group you know where did primates come from so it's really interesting to find out that that question we don't really know yet uh which is cool because people are typically only asking about one specific primate when they ask where did they come from. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to express too much agreement with the primate guy over here, but <laughs> the uh, the primate fossil record story sounds a lot quite similar to what we discussed about snakes back in episode Indeed. three. 
where it's we've got some tantalizing hints, things that may or may not actually be early snakes, and then just a sudden diversity of them after an unknown period of diversification. They were all involved evolving in secret underground natural selection pits. And or underwater. Yes. Possibly <laughs> underwater. <laughs> <laughs> That's a callback. Go back and listen to episode three, everybody. <laughs> Well, so so one one maybe difference with primates um, is it, so we we don't have we don't have the sequence of events that lead to the first U primate. But once we have the first U primate, we actually have a a, a pretty s- spectacular dare I dare I say um, fossil record of their diversification <laughs> during the Eocene. So there's two big groups big groups of, of primates that um, diversify in this in this period, and then the Eocene is the, is the longest epoch of the of the Cenozoic. The Adapa forms, and Adapa forms may be related to that group, the Strepsorhymes. So they may be related to lemurs, lemurs and lorises. It would be a very basal diver, um, divergence again. And then another group called the Umamaya forms. And these may be related to anthropoid, to haplorhymes, anthropoids and, and tarsiers. And they actually diverge from two animals that we have dispersing during that pa- Paleocene Thermal Maxima event. So there's one genus called Tylardina. And the Tyl- Tylardina is the first Umamaya form. And it's 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 almost like the, you know, it's the paleontologist dream for a genus, a genus that is, we have its descendants so well represented that the genus itself is paraphyletic. So we actually see that <laughs> Tylodina in Europe and Tylodina in North America and different species of Tylodina in North America give rise to different groups of later primates. And that, and, and you know, the Tylodinas are all similar enough that we still want to call them one genus, but we actually know that some of them are more closely related to later groups than others, which is pretty cool. And, the, and this other animal, Cantius, which gives rise to the Adapa forms. So we start, let's start talking about the Omomai forms. Um, so the Omomai forms are these vaguely, something called Tarsier-like or maybe Galago-like. They're not as specialized as these groups, but they're, they're a little bit more likely to leap. They're a little bit smaller. More of them are nocturnal. More of them are insectivorous. Um, they're very abundant in North America. There's a ton of them in North America. And there are fewer of them in, in um, Europe, but there, there's a lineage of them in Europe, too. And these guys are interesting in part because of their sort of historic importance. So the very first uh, North American primate is an Omomai form called Omo. So not first geologically, but first to be described as, as, a, as a primate called Omomies that is described as sort of the father of American paleontology, um, Joseph Leidy. The, the coolest name of any fossil primate or maybe fossil animal, Necrolemur, is a European um, Omomai form. Um, so that's that's fun. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, so I guess this other, the other group are the Adapa forms, and the Adapa forms. So it's, it's actually the, it's actually flipped. So there there are not that many of them in North America, and there are a ton of them in Europe. Hmm. These guys are often called lemur like, lemur like loris like something like that. They get to larger body sizes. They're probably more of them are, are diurnal. More of them are maybe eating leaves. Th- these are known by some pretty spectacular skeletons. So in North America, we have really nice skeletons of an animal called Metharctus. And actually, our our uh, lab group has done field work in Wyoming and found some some nice skeletons of these in, in recent years. But also, some of some are known from early in the 20th century. And in Europe, the, there's this animal Darwinius that got a lot of press a few years ago from the Messel pits. It's actually almost exactly the same age as, as the Nitharctus, and you know, it's a it's a beautiful skeleton, sort of preserved in, in two dimensions on this um, bit of slate from a uh, from a, a old fossil lake um, called Mesel in Germany. Uh, you know it's special because there's only maybe you know two or three hundred species out there named after Darwin. <laughs> we, we only only the best. Yep. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Darwinius wasn't taken. Like that one was that one was unoccupied. I guess. Huh. <laughs> Probably because everyone who thought about it said, "No way! Someone's used that already." Yes, that's exactly. <laughs> what I was thinking is like, oh, that one's that's surely there's one just somewhere, and then one guy's like. Oh, run, run it by him. Run it by him. <laughs> Has anyone actually checked? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I don't know if there's much else to say about a day forms. I doubt it. So much more to say about <laughs> um, Okay, so, so both of yeah, those um, groups of animals, they're very diverse. They're very important in the Eocene. And they're actually major contributors to um, Eocene faunas. So if you're doing field work in the Eocene in North America or Europe, you're going to find these primates. You're going to find a bunch of them. They're, they're probably like a quarter or third of, of the stuff you'll find sometimes. And this, you know, maybe this is reflected just in teeth. They're not all represented by beautiful skeletons or skulls, but the teeth are the yeah. most exciting part of the body, so it's fun. 
<laughs> As reptilian researchers, we strongly disagree. <laughs> yes, this is this is quite true. Uh, that that is something to be mentioned for everyone else. Is mammalian study when it comes to teeth very different <laughs> from reptilian? <laughs> when, when a mammalogist picks up a tooth, they say, "I th- I am pretty sure that this is that one species we found the other time." When a reptilian mm-hmm. paleontologist picks up a tooth, they go, uh, crocodilomorph? Pretty sure <laughs> it's related to crocodilians. But it could be a lizard. We don't actually know. It might <laughs> yeah, be a mosasaur. It Who might. <laughs> <laughs> when you just have ice cream cones for teeth. Oh, there's a Stephen Jay Gould joke uh, that the mammalian fossil record is a sequence of teeth mating with other teeth producing slightly altered teeth. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the interesting things about these primates, um, why why they're exciting to study and amazing. Um, one thing is the density of the record is really great, especially in North America. So we can trace anagenetic change, so evolution along a lineage, and even see lineages splitting almost in sort of real quote real time and in real paleontological time uh, across uh, you know a continuous stratigraphy in places like the the Bighorn Basin. You can trace things like body size changes. So one of the cool things that happens during the PTM, and I guess this isn't really reflected in the primates, but it's reflected in the horses and it's a cool story. Um, there's, a, there's a thing called Bergman's rule that uh, animals get larger in higher latitudes and in, in, uh, in colder climates. It's a, it's a common, mm-hmm. common observation, at least. And you actually see a Bergman effect in horses and other animals during the PTM. Animals get smaller and then they get bigger again. Ooh, because of the rate, the higher temperatures. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, so that's the kind of, of stratigraphy you have in, in North America, particularly in, in these Wyoming sites. And, and these primates you can, that are preserved there, you can trace their evolution very, at high resolution, which is pretty exciting. Um, some of them evolve interesting dental specializations. So things like plagiacoloid premolars I mentioned with, with uh, plesiodapiforms, these things evolve, uh, not plagiacoloid, but, but very enlarged premolars evolve in um, some of these animals. And we, th- th- this is another example of a no analog thing. It's a little less exciting than saber teeth, but we don't have you know primates that have giant premolars anymore. So it's kind of a puzzle. What, what are these using them for? It's something about maximizing you know the amount of gape and force you can apply or something like that. So they're they're interesting and exciting animals, even if they're a little obscure. That's that's my point. <laughs> there we go. Interesting. It sounds like the Paleocene and Eocene were full of these sort of archaic primates and relatives of primates, your omomyids, edapiforms, and, and such. So when do we start seeing the big innovations that, we, that are reflected in modern primate groups? So what, what is the rise of modern primate diversity look like? So it would be tempting to think that all these Eocene primates that surely modern primates evolved from some of these groups, right? We have this wonderful record of these primates. And people have, have proposed that as an hypothesis several times, and it may be true, but I, it's, it's smart money seems to be on the, the, the fact that, that modern none of the modern groups of animals directly descend from any of these Eocene animals. So they're not in the right place for one thing. They're in North American Europe. A lot of the, the earliest members of modern groups are occurring in Asia and in Africa. So they seem to just be a big radiation that's interesting and cool, but goes away and doesn't really leave descendants. And it goes away because an event at the end of the, in the late Eocene, um, temperatures cool globally. It's because of the, the circumantarctic current is established. So you get, mm-hmm. so this, for the first time, you get glaciation, extensive glaciation in Antarctica. You get the beginning of a, sort of an ice house earth that we, that, that we live in today. And that, as we mentioned, primates are tropically, tropically adapted animals. So that just yeah. makes northern continents uninhabitable for primates. It narrows their band of occupation right but during the eocene we do actually see some of the first representatives of modern groups living alongside these big 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 groups and they obviously by definition survive and leave leave descendants Um, so tarsiers we see the first tarsiers in china during the eocene during the middle eocene we see the first um, lorises and galagos in egypt of course as i said we don't have a fossil record for lemurs but some of some of these animals may actually be just outside of the of the maybe stem streps or and not just stem lorises or galagos, right? So they may be outside of the, the divergence between lorises, galagos, and lemurs. Hmm. So, so we have those in the Eocene. And lemurs probably get to Madagascar during the Eocene. We also have the first anthropoids. So there's a group of animals from mostly from China called the Eosimeids. And these Eosimeids may be the earliest anthropoids. It's controversial. But by the end of the Eocene, we definitely have 
absolute, no one doubts them, anthropoids. Arsenoia is the first um, from the Fayum in northern Egypt. Um, so it's very exciting. Fossil site has been worked for over a century, including by people where, where I go at, at Duke. And we have a bunch of material from there here. And it, it, it records the late Eocene all the way into the early Oligocene and the origin of definite, absolute, no one doubts them, anthropoids, and even some major anthropoid groups like the Caterines that I mentioned. The very first Caterine is probably at the Fayum. And even more interestingly and excitingly, we actually have an Eocene primate in South America. So the very first New World monkey, it's called Perupithecus, it's from Peru, is, is an Eocene animal. So during so while all this exciting stuff is happening in North American Europe with um, a day forms and life forms, the, the seeds are being planted for the modern groups. And these will sort of hang on through the Oligocene and then really begin to diversify for the most part in the Miocene. Very cool. Very interesting. That it's it's a cool that's a cool image that that modern groups of primates were kind of hanging out waiting for their turn <laughs> while these archaic groups had their heyday. Kind of like, mm. you know, the classic image of mammals in general, mm. you know, waiting out the Mesozoic until all the big ruling reptiles were knocked down. Yeah, biding their time. Their chance. Yeah. And, and it should be remarked that um, this may not be a biological phenomenon. This may be a, a sedimentological phenomenon, right? Our best fossil record comes from northern continents. And maybe maybe these modern groups are going crazy in places where we don't have good fossil record. It, it, it's quite interesting. interesting. The curse of the fossil record. And I, I appreciate your mention of that the geology is not the only factor in where we have good fossil records, but political and social statuses of different countries comes into effect you know we know a whole bunch about european and north american fossil history because we've been doing fossil hunting in those areas for decades and over century in, in certain areas many people often ask why are all the cool stuff you know fossils nowadays in china it's because they're now finding them you know they're going out and getting these fossils you know we had those heydays already and yeah. so it's it's easy to forget that if you don't look in a place, you'll never find the Afghanistan fossils, <laughs> you know, and so on and so forth. Well, well, even in Europe, which is you know supposedly super well explored, um, a ton of great discoveries coming out of Spain over the last couple of decades, and it's because the Spanish mm. fossil record never really, really been worked. So some of the most exciting fossil primates are now coming out of Spain um, for that reason. Very cool. Yeah. Cool. Right. So, so, um, so primates, as is, is I mentioned, are very climate climate controlled. So you can imagine them in the Oligocene, sort of hanging out in the tropics, waiting for climates to get better again before they could expand out. And Miocene is, you know, is, is some of the longest sustained warm periods in in the Cenozoic. So good boon times are here again once we get to the Miocene. And what you see <laughs> is primates spreading out again over. Not they didn't get to North America. Um, there actually is one animal called Egmoshashla, which is a cool little. Um, probably a primate, um, probably an, an OMI form primate that survives through the Oligocene into the early Miocene, but that's not really that's not really a that's that's the the exception that proves a rule really. <laughs> <laughs> so it should be mentioned now that now we're moving into the early Miocene, we're around the twenty million year mark. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what happens with uh, in the old world? In the old world, um, you see you see primates spread spread out again all over Asia, but also all over Europe. So you have tons of European uh, fossil sites from the Miocene with primates, mostly apes. So this is, this is the, the heyday of the ape. A bunch of species of apes, they're doing lots of different things. The world, the largest primate ever, Gigantopithecus of all, is in the Miocene. Yeah! From, from Asia. Um, you have apes that maybe are approaching bipedality. Now this is, I don't study Miocene apes at all, so this is stuff that I know people have argued over a bunch, but... It's all right, we have a Twitter follower for that. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but my impression is that Oreopithecus is doing something weird with its locomotion that makes it look a little bit like a biped. So, so that's a weird, cool thing. And Oreopithecus is living on like islands in the in the what will become Mediterranean, which is interesting. So, lots of ape evolution. And apes may actually evolve in Eurasia, or at least the modern. So, the, so apes don't evolve in Eurasia. Apes evolve in Africa. But the the hominids, the sort of the family of the modern apes, may actually have its ancestry in Eurasia, then come back to Africa and then spread out into the modern groups. Um, what happens to all these apes? Well, the Pliocene happens. So the Pliocene is basically <laughs> the return of ice house conditions. And, and the modern um, glacial cycles that define the ice ages get going around the Pliocene. So the temperatures get cooler, temperatures get, uh, climates get drier. And apes are stressed. 
And at the same time, you get this other group, the overall monkeys that I mentioned that have this, you know, superpower, the bilepidot molar. They're also, they also have a much higher reproductive rate than apes. And they begin to outcompete apes, it seems. And monkeys take over the world and the apes decline to this sort of, you know, very specialized, small number of species that we have today. And also hominins are probably, hominins, of course, evolve in the Miocene, the very first hominin is, well, Artipithecus is a Miocene animal, and also Sahelanthropus, um, which is the first putative hominin is a Miocene animal. Um, so hominins are also getting going, and they're probably putting the squeeze on apes at the same time. So monkeys and hominins out competing apes. Interesting. Hominins, of course, being our lineage mm -hmm. uh, that would eventually, you know, we've broken away from all of the other apes that, that we know of today, and we are on the way towards humanity eventually right so bipedal animals that, that's the distinction um and then in the new world you get uh, during this during this climatic optimum you get animals in patagonia um homunculus and tremesivus actually the most a lot of the fossil record for the early miocene comes from argentina very southern patagonia which is pretty crazy the, 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 these are the so you talk about latitudinal extremes the the most the closest to a pole the primates ever get are these primates in south america during the early miocene which is pretty cool Interesting. And there's some interesting history there because Argentina is like one of those countries that actually does have a long paleontological history, and it's mostly because of the, these two brothers, the Amiguinos, and they and they believe that all essentially all groups of mammals evolved in Argentina, and so they name homunculus as the human ancestor. The humans evolved from homunculus because they believe all mammals. Were. Huh. Um, and then later in the Miocene, you get sites like La Venta and Colombia that have a pretty modern looking assortment of new world monkeys so new world monkeys as we know them probably come around in the miocene in south america obviously things get th things don't get so great in argentina so there are no monkeys in southern argentina anymore but th that that big amazon basin is still there so monkeys are probably doing doing fine through the pleistocene pleistocene in, in south america and they also get to the caribbean i guess i should mention one one last note so there are, we have caribbean monkeys from some fossils and um, even a miocene fossil so it's kind of cool very cool a few episodes ago, we had a long conversation about island ecosystems, um, and I know that there are some weird island primates as well, historically. Are Caribbean monkeys weird? What are the weird island primates? Giant lemurs. Oh, yes. Well... Are, are, were, were the one example that I had back when we did that episode. Yeah, that was the one we... is the gigantism. So... I wouldn't really even call Madagascar an island. <laughs> I call it Madagascar <laughs> just an like island. Just a tiny continent? Yeah, basically. I mean, if, if, if there's an island effect, it's not because of, you know, it's, it, if, if lemurs are weird, it's because they're like isolated and evolving almost all the primate adaptations in, in one space without any other primates. It's probably not like an island thing. Yeah, it's, it's the same sort of uh, island effects that Australia has, where it's right. you can't spread and nothing can get to you, so get as weird as you want so it's like south america basically like south america isn't really i mean we'll call that an island but, um so yeah the, the caribbean monkeys aren't weird <laughs> really no. they're, they're pretty they're pretty typical <laughs> all right moving on then. they're pretty typical new world monkeys really um and in fact they look well, well the weird thing about them is they look a lot like um some some groups like Al so there's one called para alawada that looks a ton like um, the modern alawada which is the howling monkey it's not related to it closely at all it was just some kind of convergence oh that's cool cool so we we reached the that sort of Miocene into the Pliocene, and we're looking pretty modern. Uh, this is also the time that, of course, you're going to see the bulk of the story of human evolution, which is a whole other episode. It definitely is. But before we wrap up, our sort of final note, would you mind to tell us at, le at least a little bit about your own research? So my, so I'm doing my dissertation now, and at least some of it will be tra tracing the ecological diversity of primates across the Eocene. So that, that's why maybe I harped on that climatic um, climatic limit so much, because that's one of the most interesting things about primates um, from the perspective of pure vertebrate paleontology sort of you know, orientation toward asking questions about how, how groups of animals evolve through time and how mammals evolve through time, is that primates are relatively unique in, in being sort of a, a, a thermometer lineage, being so tied to a particular climatic envelope. So lots of other animals are in North America through the Eocene, and they survive or they don't. You know, they, 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 it's not they don't seem to be so clearly linked to how the temperature is doing in, in their in their diversity. So what I really want to do is trace ecological diversity, what we call disparity, through time in primates, and see if it if it tracks ecospace availability. So that could tell us about how groups of groups of mammals respond to sort of available ecospace. And we know lots of animals 
experience ecospaces of varying extents, but in other groups of animals, it may be harder to quantify them because they don't have the clear temperature relationship. Mm-hmm. That would be the, the the part of my dissertation meter is probably most most relevant to this conversation. <laughs> and how do you do that? Are you just comparing morphological features and diversity of traits? Right. So we uh, have some ways of describing the shapes of teeth mathematically that appear to have pretty good uh, dietary signal. So these things, this, is this method called Dirklet normal energy and orientation patch count, which are just ways of um, taking a digital object of a tooth, a digital mesh of a tooth from a scan, and calculating metrics on it that seem to have a good dietary signal and ecophenotypic signal. And what I want to do is trace how those, how the, the sort of the, um, the, vari- the variability of those in primates in North America and, and Europe through the Eocene. And if the variability is higher when ecospaces more is higher, so during these temperature spikes, and then also look at you. So you can do macroevolutionary modeling. So you can put these things on a tree and then calculate rates of evolution and see how rates of evolution change through time. And that's kind of another way of getting the same question of disparity and more in ecological diversity through time. Very cool. It, it's neat to see a, a mammal group that is that tied to tropical environments because you're you're used to stuff like that. You know, with reptiles, uh, you know, crocodilians you know, being my go-to example, because they very aggressively follow that line of, if it gets warm, they start moving north or south, but they start, you know, here in the northern hemisphere, start moving north immediately. You you can see it with even living populations, you know, in the years of alligators starting to, you know, have popped up in Tennessee. You know, there's been sightings. There was a news article just the other day of a American crocodile popping up in Tampa, <laughs> and it's one of those where they... You're used to seeing that with cold-blooded animals, but it's really interesting to see that with a mammalian group that ties very strictly to those uh, temperature regions. Yeah, and and actually, so as an example, um, we have crocodilians, uh, pristacanthus, in our sites yes. in, in Wyoming, where the where the blue group find the primates. So it's pretty common to like, oh, it's croc tooth, and then just like put it, put it in the misc. <laughs> <laughs> Not important. <laughs> you wound me. <laughs> Your research is really interesting. Actually, I should mention that it's okay, Will. I distinctly recall reading a paper back in grad school about people who were studying, I think these were hominins in Africa, and what they were specifically looking at them for was identifying crocodilian bite marks Woo. on the bones. <laughs> so sometimes it's better. <laughs> uh, when my animals eat, if my animals eat a primate, you won't find fossil evidence of it. Yes. <laughs> My, my animals are very clean. <laughs> There's nothing left. Because <laughs> the, they're the assassins of the animal world. No witnesses. Yeah, they are. No evidence. Ethan, your research is a really interesting change from sort of what people typically think about this notion. Uh, typically, paleontology, you consider it being, oh, okay, we're identifying a new species or we're identifying the group of species that were living at this particular site at a particular time yours is a it sounds like it's really centering in on these macro evolutionary approaches to finding broad super long-term patterns of morphological evolution in response to ecological change which is the kind of thing that gets brought up a lot these days as relates directly to modern day concerns about how do species and how do populations differ? How, how are they affected? How do they change when the environment around them changes dramatically? As the predictive aspect. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll have primates in North America again soon enough. <laughs> we already have more crocs and snakes up here, so. I keep saying, you know, there there is a silver lining to this whole global warming thing. <laughs> We're going to have shallow oceans, lots of islands, and primates and crocs coming back up north. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of okay with this. Bring back Mosasaurs. <laughs> let's, let's get that Western Interior Seaway back up and running. Oh. So, Ethan, as a primate person, a very important question for you. Who do you root for in Planet of the Apes? <laughs> well, I always had a partiality for the orangutan. Thank you. Good answer. <laughs> Dr. Zayas? Yeah, well, he's just such an interesting character. I don't know if that's anything to do with his apeness. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, they need some gibbons in that movie. That would, that would be fun to watch. Gibbons are the best apes, I think. They're they're just they're they're very charming animals. They're they're very uh, 
They, Gibbons love life. You can tell. Uh huh. I'm a huge fan of Gibbons. If I had to choose a favorite primate, that's typically the first group that comes to mind. They're pretty awesome. I always felt like they'd be the ninjas of the Planet of the Ape world if they existed, just because they're so acrobatic. <laughs> yeah. What is it about their wrist joints? Um, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> I think I had read that they have ball and socket wrist joints. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I suppose that might be true. Yeah. About, but but so so the, the locomotion they're doing is called brachiation, right? So they're swinging mm. by their arms like a sort of like a pendulum, and they're and that's another primate uniqueness. There's no other group of mammals that does that. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. Very cool. That's that's also one of the reasons orangutans are very obvious, obviously my favorite. And to all our listeners, since we are not showing the videos of our Skype chats, I am a very lanky redhead. <laughs> <laughs> so I've always felt a bit of a fondness to <laughs> the orangutan. A bit of a kinship. <laughs> they, they just, they spoke to me. I saw myself in them and vice versa. <laughs> But I've always loved them because they're the largest arboreal creature today. They are the largest tweet tree tweed dwelling mammal, the largest <laughs> tree dwelling animal, uh, which is fast, like which is amazing because they're they are not the largest by a small margin. They're big. Yeah, and, and and that's part of that specialization that apes do is they all become sort of it's called suspensory. So they, they evolve to um, spread their weight around as many limbs as possible with their sort of hands and feet and things and that's also what spider monkeys do in, in south america which is what, how they're sort of convergent on on apes so orang oh. orangs do that sort of par excellence and then chimps do it some when they get in trees and chimps also will do that swinging kind of semi brachiation thing some gorillas obviously don't really climb that much especially as adults because they're they're huge but but, but in general apes uh, apes are maximizing that ability to stay in trees at very large body size which seems to be the only thing they can do to get away from the monkeys right <laughs> just yeah. to, to find a niche that the monkeys haven't filled which is basically eating really ripe fruit um at, at the ends of, of at the ends of branches which is so interesting because considering how successful we as an ape are it is fascinating to know that apes in general are not thriving you know you would you think that you know one of the arguably the most successful mammal being an ape would mean apes as a group are probably also doing well but it's not the case, which is super contradictory. Yeah. And it's a really interesting that Ethan made this point earlier that one of the reasons apes seem to be diminished is because of competition with our own lineage. Mm -hmm. And especially today, and, you know, these days, apes are doing terribly uh, directly because of uh, our own species and along the effects with, that we're having. Along with almost everything else. So I hope you and your primate loving ways can have that. Take that. There are some <laughs> cool animals, but. Boy, look what look what you've done. Yeah, look what man. You've done <laughs> you and your opposable thumbs. Well, we've mostly done it to our to ourselves as an order. <laughs> like like the mafia, we kill our own. <laughs> <laughs> that is now how I picture the ape family tree. <laughs> With us as the dawn. <laughs> I gotta say, I have often thought that there are not nearly enough horror movies about primates. No, definitely. I think in general. There's a lot of I mean there's a lot of scariness. Technically, most are. Uh, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> most fact, horror movies. All horror movies. <laughs> who, is, who is the real monster? <laughs> oh, there, cool. There, there are Capetians in uh, Jumanji, I guess. Yeah. There is. There is. Uh, there are two horror movies that I know of that where the quote monster is baboons. Mm -hmm. That's pretty scary. Uh, one of them is Shakma, which is <laughs> about a baboon that gets loose in a lab and runs around and starts killing everybody, which I think is stupid. Yep. But the other one is, I think it's called In the Shadow of Kilimanjaro. And if I remember correctly, the plot is that a bunch of people get stuck out in the savannah somewhere during a massive drought and famine. And all the local baboon tribes have gathered into one massive colony to search for food everywhere so the monster creature in that movie is a colony of something like ten thousand baboons which is which is a baboon thing right they they, they make these yeah. super groups um so that's that is accurate yeah. accurate primate socioecology <laughs> also cool. legitimately terrifying yes i would not want to encounter <laughs> i would not want to encounter a baboon in the wild but a group of baboons surely not yeah very cool Cool. All right. Well, I will concede that primates 
are pretty cool. It's they they are my my closing statement on their coolness is the biggest thing I am jealous of them for is having grasping feet. <laughs> what I would pay to be able to have monkey fist feet. And, and that that is that is your primate patrimony actually. That's more important in the origin of primates than grasping hands is the grasping grasping hallux and we 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 chuck it away in our and our heedless <laughs> desire for bipedality. See, where our foolishness knows no bounds. See where it has taken us. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I think that that is about it. That's the place to wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, once again, huge thanks to Ethan Fullwood for joining us on this episode. That was super cool. Uh, neither one of us could have done primates justice, nor would we have wanted to no. uh, the way that you did. <laughs> So we're super happy to have had you here. As a reminder for our listeners out there, um, we will, as always, put up blog, uh, uh, links and pictures for more information and for more visuals on our blog. We release new episodes every fortnight, so keep an eye out for episode eight in two weeks. And as always, please reach out to us, get in contact with us, tell us what you think, comments, complaints, suggestions, requests on Twitter, Facebook, uh, gmail at common descent podcast at gmail.com on the blog leave us itunes reviews any way that you can think of to get in touch with us we are happy to hear from you messenger pigeons yeah you know, whatever works messenger primates yes <laughs> no please which, which don't i think it's just the mail the mail delivery person okay yeah that works i was about to say any other kind of messenger primate please don't send that to my house that'd be terrifying to wake up to. <laughs> <laughs> Messenger baboons. <laughs> Just saying, I'm a monkey sitting on the end of my bed with a letter in its hand. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. We will see everybody next time. Thanks once more, Ethan. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for having me. And thank you all out there for listening. We hope, hope you'll join us for the next one. Right, take care, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog, where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time.